Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to uh, this next lesson, uh, the Harmony of the Gospels, the message of Gabriel, lesson number six, message of Gabriel. So this is the next step in the harmony. Um, so when you think about harmony, it's all four Gospels kind of pressed together, okay, uh, within a timeline of events, and you follow along those timeline of events. So the message of Gabriel is the next. We covered genealogies last week. So the message of Gabriel this week, and uh, let's say a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll get started. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank Thee for Your grace and Your goodness, O God. I thank Thee for Your blessings uh, in our lives. Lord, I ask You to please just use this message today to, to reach others, Lord, to help them to, to see Your will and Your way in the world. And Lord, in You are all things accomplished. Lord Jesus, I praise Thee and thank Thee for all that You do. And I look forward to your return, O oh Lord Jesus, and in your name, Jesus, amen. Okay, so I hope to cover the, the, the message of Gabriel to Zacharias today, and I think we will. But the, uh, uh, the, the message to Mary, uh, we're not going to get into that. We'll do that probably another day. Um, so the message to Zacharias is found in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, the complete account is Luke 1. Uh, verses 5 through 25 is the complete account, okay? So we're going to uh, read down uh, through this account, and we're going to break out each, um, each um, uh, scripture. Uh, so, so let's start with verse 5, and then uh, we're going to see what the Word of God has to say to us today. All right, verse 5 of Luke 1. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abijah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So Herod the Great reigned from 37 to 4 BC, okay? His kingdom included Samaria, Galilee, much of Perea, and part of Syria. So he had a rather large kingdom. Herod was... Uh, uh, put in place and confirmed by uh, the Roman Senate um, as uh, in charge of the Jewish people, okay? So Herod was only half Jewish and was eager to please the Roman Emperor and the Roman Senate. So what Herod did, he uh, expanded and beautified the temple um, within Jerusalem to appease the Jews. But then also he had a Roman eagle placed over the entrance to the temple, temple yards or temple uh, entrance. So, so Herod was uh, uh, attempting to please many people. All right. So Herod didn't trust God. So we we know this for a fact from the scriptures. Um, and his actions uh, were only for political purposes. Okay. So Herod the Great uh, would also order the massacre of infants in a futile attempt to kill Jesus. Uh, after he was identified as king of the Jews by all of the uh, scribes and Pharisees within the temple courts so um, and the three wise men. So, so he uh, uh, attempted at that time frame to kill Jesus, so he massacred infant, infants. So if he had been a believer or believed in God or trusted God, he would not have felt like this was a threat to his throne. He would have sought Jesus to, Jesus to worship him. A certain, so next part of that scripture, verse 5, a certain priest named Zacharias, who was of the course of Abijah, okay? A Jewish priest was a minister of God who worked at the temple. That's what they were, okay, at this time frame. They managed the upkeep of the temple, so you had uh, a large group of priests uh, for a certain course um, that would manage the upkeep of the temple, they would teach the people the scriptures, right? And they would uh, direct uh, the uh, planned worship for the scribes as the scribes would teach throughout the city because the scribes were the doctors at law, all right? So they were not priests most of the time. Um, at the time of Zacharias, uh, there were about 20,000 priests across the region of of Judea and into Samaria and all the region of what was what we used to know as Israel, okay? About 20,000 priests throughout the country. So there were just too many to minister at any one time in the temple. So 
And this all goes all the way back to David. Uh, David set up different courses and he directed to have different courses of priests come in and run and manage the temple for certain periods of time. So the Jewish priests were divided into 24 separate groups of about 1,000 each in each priest's group underneath a particular priest father, okay? All right, so in according to David's instructions found in 1 Chronicles chapter 24, let's turn over to 1 Chronicles 24, okay, verses uh, uh, 1 through 10. The whole uh, thing is like verses 1 through 19, um, where it breaks down all of the, the priests. So we're going to um, read uh, verses, um, so we're going to read verses 3. David distributed them, both Zadok and the sons of Eliezer and Abimelech of the sons of Himar, according to their offices in their service. There were more men found of the sons of Eleazar than the sons of Ithamar, and thus were they divided. So, um, so they, he divided those down into groups, all right? So among the sons of Eleazar were 16 chief men, okay, of their fathers, and eight among the sons of Ithamar. So the courses were broken down underneath uh, these men here. All right, thus they were divided by lot, okay, one sort with another, for the governors of the sanctuary, governors of the house of God, and were of the sons of Eleazar and the sons of Ithamar, okay? So that's a 24. All right, so, um, and Shimei, the son of Nathaniel, the scribe, one of the Levites, wrote them before the king and the princess and Zadok and the priest and Abimelech, the son of Bithar, before the chief of the fathers of the priests and Levites, one principal household being taken for Eleazar and one taken for Ithamar. Now the first of the lot came forth in um, so, so that, that, now these next set of scriptures are the lots breaking down. So if you jump down to verse 10, it, it talks, it says the seventh goes to, uh, Hekazaz and the eighth to Abijah. So we know that, uh, Zacharias was of the, the eighth course of Abijah, okay, eighth course of Abijah. So that's where this is found at. So, so you see here in verse 10 that as it's stated, um, in verse 5 of Luke, which we read, okay, that Zacharias fell underneath the course of Abijah, okay, all right? Now, there were certain lots that were cast within that course based off a, a weekly period, daily period, um, as to what the priests were to do when they were in the temple uh, teaching and preaching, okay, and managing the temple. So, Zacharias was on duty at the temple during his course at this time frame based off of what had been set in place uh, for the offspring of the line of Abijah, okay? Each morning, it reached all the way back to David. So each morning, a priest was to enter the holy place in the temple and burn incense. They were to trim lights uh, in the morning and then uh, light lights in the evening, okay? So the priests that were working in the temple would cast lots uh, to decide who would enter into the inner sanctuary to burn the incense, okay? And not every priest got this honor, okay? And, and sometimes this honor will only come once in a lifetime. So one day the lot to enter the inner sanctuary fell on Zacharias. Now, now as a, as a man, we might think, well, this is, uh, this is um, uh, you know, by chance, okay? It's not by chance at all when it comes to God. So even though the lot fell on Zacharias that day, it was not by chance. It was not by chance. Not by what man's view is. So things happen by chance. So it was so it was not by chance that Zacharias was chosen to enter the holy place. Perhaps this was a once in a lifetime opportunity for Zacharias. He'd never done it before. But God was in control where all things would happen as they are intended to happen. And that's the thing. No matter what we do in this world, okay, God's will will always be accomplished, okay? All right, so Zacharias and Elizabeth were both of the priestly descent of Aaron. So uh, Elizabeth is Zacharias' wife. And they were both righteous before God, working and walking in all of the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless, okay? So when you consider that and, and what's said there, all right, so walking in the Lord, blameless, and walking in the commandments and orders of the Lord, blameless, okay? How can you be blameless, okay? Well, were they sinless? No, they were not sinless. All, we all have sin. We're all sinful human beings. They were sinful human beings just like us, all right? 
But Zacharias and Elizabeth didn't merely go through the motions of following God's law. In this day, you know, they followed the law, the Mosaic law, okay? So they didn't just follow the law. That was not their intent. They backed up the law with their outward compliance of the law with inward obedience. So they were obedient in the heart. So Zacharias and Elizabeth had obedience that was from the heart. That is why they were called righteous before God. They were blameless because God knew their heart. God does not look on the outward appearance of man, but he looks on the heart, okay? So man looks on the outward appearance of man and says, oh, that's a good man. But the heart of that man is evil and wicked, all right? So, all right, verse, uh, verse 7. So, um, well, before we hit verse 7, okay? So for God looketh on the heart of man, okay, all right? And that is where man's true desires are. That's why God looks on the heart of man. If a man say he has faith, but does not have works, then his faith is dead. So if that man says, oh yeah, I believe I'm going to church and all this good stuff, but then during the week, he parties like a wild animal, has a good time, he's drunken, and he is uh, just a wild guy, okay? Doesn't show the signs of a Christian there. Not at all, okay? All right? So, what is your purpose for doing things, Christian? What's your purpose, all right? So, is your purpose selfish so that you get praise of men, you know? And we've got to be careful for this because praise of men sometimes is desired by man. So, and it's an inner uh, desire that we have sometimes to be praised of men, okay? So, so what's your purpose for doing things? Do you want to be praised of men? Or, or maybe... You know, what, is it something out of your actions that you want and that's why you're doing this thing? Or is your purpose selfless where the Holy Spirit is leading you? So how are you being led? Are you being led by yourself? Are you being led by the Holy Spirit? Okay, so consider this, all right? So verse seven, and they had no child, okay? They had no child. Zacharias and Elizabeth had been married for a very long time, probably 40 years, maybe 40 years at this time frame. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they both were well stricken in years. So 40 years, so I've been married for 35. I'm in my 50s. Um, they could be married almost 50 years, okay? And they may have been in their 60s or they could have been married for longer than 50. They may have been in their 70s, you know? But they were well stricken in years. That's what the scripture tells us. That means they were old people. So during this time frame, women highly desire to have children. If a woman was barren, it was considered by the people to be a indicative divine dissatisfaction on a person, okay? Okay, and but that's the human point of view, okay? That's why the, the society viewed it this time frame. So this often brought about a social reproach from other people in that society, Jewish, the Jewish society. They, had social reproach against Elizabeth, you know, uh, because she was barren. So they were saying, well, you know, Elizabeth's womb is probably, you know, dead, you know. So God has disciplined her for some wrong she's got on the inside, some sin she's got, all right? So that's man's point of view. That's man's point of view, all right? So children were greatly desired since the children brought personal happiness to the family, and it was considered to be a blessing from God um, so that's the way the people viewed it. Now, that is true, okay? Children are a blessing from God. And that is true that it brings personal happiness to the family. What's not true is if a woman has a barren womb, that is because God's disciplining her. So God has a plan for all things, folks, all things. So, so consider this. So when you pray... God answers prayer in his own way. So if you're barren, you're barren for some reason, all right? Okay? And, and so God has a way in his own time and will for things to happen. So we might want to answer right away in our minute society. We want everything done last second, all right? So when God does not answer right away like we think he should, all right, so we give up. And we quit praying, and we start to doubt God's overall power and purpose. You're like, well, God's not treating me right. Well, hey, man, God's not a respecter of persons on this earth, okay? God 
has his will that he's going to accomplish on this earth, all right? You need to be patient and wait, Christian. You need to be patient and wait, okay? In this example of Zacharias and Elizabeth, we see that God asked, uh, that God answered their prayers in an impossible situation that they had been asking for for a long time, okay? All right, so Elizabeth age, she was well stricken in years. What happens to a woman? They cease with childbearing. So they get to a point that their body will no longer uh, bear children, okay? And her womb was also barren. So everyone knew this. So Elizabeth had given up. She, maybe she hadn't given up. Maybe she was still praying. Maybe Zacharias was still praying, okay? But God had heard that prayer over all those years, and he was going to answering it in his time, in his place, okay? All right, so to bring about the fulfillment of all the prophecies concerning the Messiah, to include the one who would call out in the wilderness, the one who would call out to repent in the wilderness, which was prophesied about John, okay? All right, so, so when you come to God in prayer, okay, be open to what God can do in the impossible, okay? All right, so situations that you may have in your life, all right? So you must wait on God to work in his own way and his own time. Always remember, God is outside of time. We are in time, okay? All right, so God is outside of time because so he has a certain thing that he will accomplish in this world throughout its time, okay, from beginning to end. So please remember that when you pray, be patient, okay? All right, so verse 8, And it came to pass, while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, in verse 9, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord, okay? His lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. So his lot got cast that day, okay? So as Zacharias was of the course of Abijah, which we explained, his lot failed to burn incense and to keep the incense burning on the altar in front of the most holy place. So this was one of the priest's duties, uh, that was drawn by Lot. So when the priests uh, supplied the fresh incense, when they would go into the Holy of Holies, they provide the fresh incense in the morning, okay, um, there would be a thick cloud of smoke that would come up off of the altar, and it would boil out of the tent. Okay, it would come out of the tent, all right? And then the this, this smoke would rise up to heaven, all right? The Jewish people at this time frame would be out front. They knew, they knew what time the incense was going to be burned at this period of time, and they were outside waiting, praying, okay, waiting for this incense to come out, okay? The smoke would drift heavenward, symbolizing that their prayers were ascending up to God, okay? So that was what was one of the, uh, uh, what do you want to call it? Um, uh, my brain ain't working today. Um, it was one of those things um, that they, uh, procedures uh, they had fallen into, or we need to be at the temple at this time frame so we can see this incense smoke come out so we can pray, you know, because we can see our prayers going up to heaven. Once again, anytime you pray before God, those prayers go to heaven. Amen? All right? So fall on your knees of prayer and be patient, Christian. Okay? All right. So in Exodus chapter 30, verses 6 through 8, um, there were certain directions for the building of the altar incense, and God tells Moses this, all right? He tells me, and so Exodus 30, verses 6 through 8, and then shalt, then thou shalt put it before the veil. Now that is the, the incense ark, the ark of the incense. That is the veil that is by the ark of the testimony before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee, and Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning when he dresseth the lamps, and he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at evening, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generation. So this was still going on all the way from where Moses was directed 
uh, to tell Aaron to do it, okay? So, and ordinarily, a priest would have this privilege very infrequently, as I stated earlier, and sometimes never due to the number of priests, so the duties were assigned by lot. So the fact that Zacharias had this lot and this day was in front of him to do this task was not by chance. It was God's will. So Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33 states this, and you may not know this, the lot is cast into the lap. Boom. Lot's cast into the lap. So what you do, what do you do when the lot is cast into your way, okay? If that lot is difficult times, if it's good times, if it's sick times, if it's healthy times, or if it's poor times, or if it's richer times, what do you do when that lot is cast into your lap, okay? Do you pray and do you wait on the Lord patiently, okay? Like Zacharias and Elizabeth did, all right? There are perfect examples here. Now, so the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord, okay? Excellent thought, okay? So anytime you're down or you're in trouble, it, the whole disposing of is in the Lord for that lot. Christian, so no situation that comes your way is a mistake. It's there for a purpose. I was asking that question this morning as I prayed. Why am I in this situation I'm in right now? All right. So God will use all things for your good. So you have to trust the Lord, okay? And it may be difficult with these human frail bodies, but you must trust the Lord. That's the only answer, okay? Don't lean to your own understanding, as Proverbs 3, 5 says. All right. So, verse 10. So here was Zacharias burning incense, okay? The whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. So you have all these people waiting outside for the time of incense. Verse 11, and there appeared unto him the angel of the Lord standing on the right side, right side of the altar of incense. So the same, here's Zacharias. He's coming up to the altar of incense to burn the incense. Maybe he's looking down and then he looks up and there's the angel of the Lord on the right side of the altar incense. So this angel identifies himself as being Gabriel. All right, now Gabriel is standing on the south side of the altar since the altar always faced east, okay? So Gabriel is in visible form and he spoke in audible words to Zacharias. Verse 12, and when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. I can imagine that Gabriel standing there in visible form was probably a very impressive figure, okay? All right, um, every Israelite knew that when an angel showed up, okay, and identified himself as Gabriel, right, they knew that something was getting ready to happen, whether it was for good or bad, okay? So fear fell upon Zacharias for two reasons. One, he had no why the angel was there. There was the angel. It had been 400 years since any type of activity from God had happened. All right, so, so now we have uh, Gable standing here. You have Zacharias in fear um, standing in front of the altar incense, and Gabriel is on the south side, all right? Okay? All right, so, so the, uh, there was some type of message going to come from the, the angel, and I can sure uh, Zacharias began to think about that. All right, so this message would be delivered, and the Israelite people knew that there would be a message. All right, so now the people outside didn't know, but Zacharias knew, all right? And Zacharias wondered, okay? All right, so... So one of the things that is a common reaction here is fear is a common reaction. Um, and we find that whenever an angel comes around that there is a common reaction, okay? Um, so in Judges chapter 6, verse 22 and 23, when Gideon was waiting um, to, for an answer, so Gideon um, looked over and he saw someone and so when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, 
Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face, and the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Okay? Um, so he was a afraid, you know, so the angel always seemed to say, fear not, okay, thou shalt not die, okay, so now there's, there's uh, two angels identified by name in the Bible, okay, uh, Gabriel and Michael, all right, and so they are both found in the beginning of time in the book of Daniel, all right, uh, so in Daniel chapter 8 verse 16 and chapter 9 verse 21, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of of Uliah, which is called, and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Verse 21, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. All right. So in Daniel chapter 10, verses 13 and 21, we find Michael, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and 20 days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. In verse 21, I will show you the, which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince, okay? Michael was the prince of Israel, okay? All right, so now you will find other instances of Michael and Gabriel in the Bible by name, but these are four sentences. Uh, they're not the only ones about Michael and Gabriel, but he, here they are. Kind of gives you an idea. That they are named by name in Daniel. So in, in verse 13, so let's move it on to verse 13 of Luke 1. Jumping back into Luke. So Gabriel gets right to the point of the message to Zacharias right up front. Tells him exactly why he's here. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. So, so as you saw in Judges, fear not. He uses the term fear not here. All right. As a word of reassurance that's always given throughout the Old and New Testaments when the angel appears and the person's afraid, the angel recognizes that person's afraid. And so they always give this uh, fear not, all right? So the, when the disciples were with Jesus in the boat and they were crossing the Sea of Galilee, the storm arose and Jesus calms the storm and he asked the disciples a question, why are ye so fearful? He could see they were greatly afraid. And so uh, how is it that you have no faith? And that's Mark 440. So how is it you have no faith? You know, why well, don't you trust in God to really... Um, like in verse 6 of Proverbs says, acknowledge God in all thy ways and he will direct thy paths. So if you really do that, you really have no fear about things in this world because you knew that God, if you acknowledge God, he's going to direct your paths. If you trust in the Lord and you don't lean unto your own understanding, then the, God's going to help you and he's going to direct your paths as long as you acknowledge him each day. All right, that's what I try and do because I trust in the Lord. So how is your faith, Christian? Are you trusting in God? Or are you fighting God's will for your life? That, that's the thing, you know. Uh, oftentimes we fight God's will. I want to fight God's will this week because my legs hurt so bad. But you know what? Hey, I'm, I'm in God's will. I'm going to follow him. So we do not know how long Zacharias had been praying for a son. That we don't know, okay? But here is what the promise and the answer was. Now, I am sure it was likely for his whole life he prayed for his wife Elizabeth's womb to, to open up and 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 bring forth a son. So, so maybe Zacharias was praying right then as he was putting the incense, getting ready to put the incense on the altar. Maybe Zacharias was praying for the Messiah to come, okay? Um, that was prophesied to come because they were really wanting that at this time frame because they'd been in a Roman impression for a while. So it must have added to uh, Zacharias' concern or fear, or Zacharias may have thought it kind of odd, that the angel would say that your prayers have been answered and that he would have a son, okay? Zacharias and Elizabeth were very old, very old. And, and Zacharias was like, how in the world are we going to have a son? I'm an old man, she's an old woman, there's no way, okay? All right? And Zacharias had uh, likely given up hope of ever having a child, okay? 
Um, and, and, and Elizabeth too, maybe they were really, had they prayed their whole lives, they had stopped praying now. And who knows, okay? What was going on in his thoughts? Then the angel states, thou shalt have a son and thou shalt call his name John, all right? I can only imagine what Zacharias thought about this when he heard it. The first son in a Jewish line is always named after the kindred of that line, never outside of the kindred, all right? So there was a lot going through Zacharias' mind when it's like, wow, his name's going to be John. Whoa, I'm going to have a son. Whoa, you know, all right? So the name John in Hebrew is the Lord is gracious. That's what it stands for. The Lord is gracious. And you can only imagine as time went on during the pregnancy, um, that later on when Zacharias was mute, and we're going to get into that next week, that later on when he learned from Mary, when he heard Mary say that she was going to have a son, they would be called Jesus, which meant in Hebrew, the Lord saves. Amazing, okay? So both names were directed by God. The names were not chosen by human parents or by man. Throughout the Gospels, God acts graciously and always saves his people, okay? God is not willing that any should perish. If you call upon the name of his son, he will save you, okay? Call upon the name of his son if you do not know him, okay? So he wants all to come to the saving knowledge of him, all right? His son, Jesus Christ. So God brought joy to the world and peace for all mankind through his son, Jesus Christ. Verse 14 and 15 of Luke 1, And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, at the birth of John. It's wonderful. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither vine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb, okay? There was great joy when Zacharias was born, and many came from a long distance around to see this. And they came to their house for the circumcision, and it was a wonderful thing. So when Zacharias was asked what the name of his son would be, he wrote on a tablet that his name would be John, okay? His name would be John, all right? So because at this time frame, about verses 6, 4, 6, 5, he was still mute. He couldn't speak, okay? Couldn't speak, all right? So he had a tablet that he wrote on. But he wrote down, his name was John. I'm sure Elizabeth was telling the others there, hey, look, his name shall be called John. They were like, what? This lady's crazy. She just had this baby, you know? Why does she want to call him John? We need to find out what the man of the family says, you know? So then the man of the family said, hey, his name is be John, all right? It's like, wow. So these people were shocked. So great fear came upon all those in the region because the Lord had started to move again. The Lord had spoke, all right? Yahweh was speaking again to the people of Israel. So there had been 400 silent years, and now God was speaking again. It's wonderful, okay? So yes, there was fear and amazement at what happened to Zacharias and Elizabeth. John was clearly a special messenger from God, okay? So Jesus stated in Matthew 11:11. 11, 11, Verily I say unto you, among that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. So, and these were the words of God. Jesus stated this, even today, one, there hath not risen one greater than John the Baptist. I think this applies to all time. John was filled with the Holy Ghost in the womb, Elizabeth, so that when Mary came to visit in verse 41, and it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Wow. Wow. The child John was to be subject to the Nazarite vial of abstinence from alcoholic drinks or, or from, from the vine. So John was clearly a Nazarite all his life. He ate locusts and honey. He lived in the wilderness. He wore skins for clothing. And he ate locusts and honey, right? Um, so this message of Gabriel was sent from God, and it was received by Zacharias. And it came at a time when the people of Israel were looking and praying for the promised Messiah to come. They believed that the promised Messiah was going to come and relieve them of the Roman oppression 
and uh, set up a king there on earth. But this is not what John and Jesus were coming for. Amen. All right. So verse 25. Um, so verse 25 of John. Mark, Luke, John. No, it's where Luke, Luke 1. Uh, Luke 1, Mark, Luke. Man, I'm all discombobulated here. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, in verse 18, and Zacharias said of the angel, whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, stand, and I stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things be performed. Okay? So he's proven a point to Zacharias because Zacharias doubted. He actually doubted. And because thou believest not my words. The angel knew, all right, that Zacharias was doubting, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Every ha everything happens in God's time and for God's will, all right? And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple because he was probably, I can't speak. You know, how am I going to deal with this, all right? So he tarried so long in the temple. And, and so, and when he came out, verse 22, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. He beckoned. You know, he just beckoned to them. Man. Think about, hey, maybe I'll just have him come up closer to me. Okay? And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration, so he had that period of time of his course, he had to continue his ministration, were accomplished, he departed to his own house. So he went to his house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying... Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked upon me to take away my reproach from among men. How beautiful is that? How broken of heart this woman must have been and how much joy must have been her soul that she was now pregnant. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful scriptures today. Hey, when you read these things and contemplate over them, they will bring tears to your eyes. Amen. Now next week we will... Uh, cover the message of Gabriel to Mary. All right, thank you for listening, my folks and friends.